Thank you. The way I usually start is I like to kind of pretend that we're walking into a spin room now and walking into one of my classes. How many people have taken a spin class here? Wow, that's awesome. Okay, so we walk into this rather large room with let's say 50 bikes and it's dimly lit, no windows. It's a half circle and it's set up like a stadium. So each level is raised and that way every rider can see the instructor and the instructor can see every rider. There's no such thing as a bad bike because you can see from everywhere. But the reason why we did that was more about the fact that as the instructor, I could try and connect with everyone. I could try and make eye contact or say hello before the class started and, and the entire group would feel connected to each other. So I come in, I come to my little podium, my platform in the center back of the room. I say hi to everyone, I let everyone know Sorry, I ask everyone, are you ready to start? And then usually I get some woo-hoos. And um, I say, let's do it. I turn the lights off so it's dark, except for my spotlight. And I reach down to the sound system and I hit the play button. And that's when it all begins. That's when the journey begins. And I say journey because it's never been an exercise class for me. It's been a lot more than that. It's been kind of this perfect storm of uh, physical exertion with an emotional, mental component added to it. I was given the nickname a long time ago, Fountain of Ruth, very clever. And at first it was given to me because I've been kind of genetically blessed and I've always looked a bit younger than my years. Uh, I also lead a healthy lifestyle, so that helps. Um, but I kind of also grew into it because when I started my career as a spin instructor, I started talking in the spin class and, and talking about specific challenges that I might have been going through on that particular day. But I would never talk about them subjectively. I would talk about them in general terms with the hopes that someone else in the room or several other people in the room would relate to it. And perhaps there were people in there going through the same challenges. And then we would think about those challenges while we were riding and again, physically exerting ourselves. And it all kind of worked together to become very cathartic. And so, at the end of the 45 minutes, we had the ability to feel transformed, to almost kind of have a, mi a mini reinvention of ourselves. We'd walk into the room feeling a certain way and then walk out feeling another way and, and hopefully better and maybe more equipped to conquer the day. And that's what drew me to the spin class in the first place. I think that Connection, especially in today's world, is more important than ever, and the need to connect for us humans is never gonna go out of style. We're always gonna need it, and so um, it's why I believe in what I do so much and why I wanna perpetuate it and keep it going. So here I am today, I'm 61. I pause because you're supposed to all gasp at that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's try it again, I'm 61. Right? I know. And I have twin daughters who are 29 and actually still want a vacation with me, which is really great. And um, I have a great life. I started two nationally successful companies. I wrote a book uh, basically because I wanted to have a, a bigger platform to kind of spread the word on, on what I do and what I believe in. And that's kind of what I want to do here today. I, you know, we're obviously not on bikes, but I want to be able to get across to you the importance of um, resilience and reinvention and how we build resilience to figure out kind of what we want to do in our lives over and over again and who we are. And I think most importantly, liking ourselves uh, at the end of the day. So getting to where I've gotten, has it been an easy road? Not in the least. I went through periods of depression, of low self-esteem, of uh, a failed dance career, drama in my marriage, which led to a divorce, a dissolution of a business partnership, financial problems, and this was all, all while navigating how to be a single mom from uh, my girl's age of six, which is when I left the marriage. 
So it's been a lot. Um, but I obviously got through it, and I learned how to get through it, and I learned how to build strength. And I'm going to tell you my story in, I guess it's four parts, and, and each part is kind of about a reinvention that I went through. Um, the first part I called divorce to soul cycle, but I, I obviously need to talk a little bit about what happened before divorce and growing up. I grew up on Long Island, uh, New York, and my dad was a physician and my mom was a psychotherapist. Crazy. <laughs> um, and so I was always around doctors and people from the hospital community, never around business, never around business people, had no affinity to it, knew nothing about it. When I was eight years old, my mother decided I had to go to ballet class because I was getting a bit of a belly. Like, great things to focus on, mom, but okay. And so she put me in ballet class and I was hooked. I, right away, I just took to it and I loved it and I loved dancing. And in retrospect, when I look back and think about that and why I was so into it, it kind of made sense to me. My mother, was very narcissistic, um, you know, that person who just would kind of like suck the air out of the room. And as a result, there wasn't a lot of room for me. I had older, actually twin brothers who were quite a lot. And, and then I came along and I was the princess and the daughter and the perfect child. And so my role very early on was to please her. My father was very easy and he and I were very close, but she was tough. And uh, by having that role of needing to please her all the time and becoming uh, the child of someone who was always right, uh, knew way more than I did at every point of my life, um, I learned very quickly how to defer to her and to actually have very little self-confidence and actually no voice at all. So it kind of made sense that I was drawn to dancing because that quickly became my way of expressing myself without having to have a voice. And my ballet classes led to modern dance classes and jazz classes and before I knew it I was taking the train into New York City to take professional classes and I decided I was going to be a professional dancer. So I graduated high school, I chose a college that had a good academic program but a good dance department as well, Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts and graduated, moved right to New York City because that was the only place I wanted to be and started what I thought would be my dance career and I went to auditions every week and took dance classes every day and rejection after rejection after rejection, you know how that works in the performing arts, it's very hard um, and it's a hard life and so I realized about a year and a half, two years in that I just was not cut out for it and Many people are and they keep going at it until they make it and I just, I couldn't. I was really good at what I did but not good enough. And so that was really my first moment where I had to figure out what was next and I did not have a clue. I, I, I stood there and I thought, I have no other interests, not interested in anything. I have no idea what I'm gonna do. Have, have you ever been in that situation? Thank you. So, um, and, and it was traumatic enough to give up something I had spent my life working on. So I thought, okay, well, sort of interested in food and cooking, and I saw an ad for an office manager at a catering company in the West Village, and so I called, they said, you're hired, and I took the job and sat behind a desk, which was very new for me, for two years, and I was miserable. I hated it. And um, during those two years, it was also the first time I had to think about exercise because it was always uh, built in for me. So I started taking, uh, so it was the 80s, and it was all about aerobics then, remember Jane Fonda? And there was a little kind of dance aerobics studio on the Upper West Side where I lived. And so I, I went there and I started taking classes. And very soon after taking classes, the owner of the studio said, you know, you really should be teaching here. And I thought, oh, okay, well, it's kind of dancey and I'll be moving again and physical. And I said, 
great, I'll do it. So I kind of did that on the side, you know, obviously didn't make a lot of money doing that, but I enjoyed it and little did I know, I was kind of getting my masters in group fitness with this first experience and foray into exercise. Um, but all I wanted to do was quit the other job, but this wouldn't have supported me. So also during this time, I got set up on a date and I met someone and I could tell very quickly that he was someone who was very ambitious and was going to make a really nice life for himself and do very well. And I thought, cringeworthy moment for feminists. I like to think that I'm one too. I thought, this will solve all my problems. I'm just going to get married. <laughs> then I don't have to think about a career because, again, I didn't have the confidence to think I would figure it out. And this will solve all my problems. So that's what I did. And it wasn't that simple. I was young and I was in love and I thought, really did think this was the right person for me, but it wasn't. And um, there was no divorce in my family, so the thought of divorce was out of the question. I couldn't fathom that. Um, so I decided I always wanted to have kids, so I'll just do that. We'll have kids and I'll put all my focus on the kids and I'll be a mom and that will solve everything. Well, you know it doesn't work that way. So we did have our twin girls and um, I was really unhappy in the marriage. Um, he had anger management issues and so there was just a lot of bad behavior and um, again kind of went with my low self-esteem at the time because I allowed it for quite a while. Uh, my father was dying and we were so close and I was about 33 or 34 and I didn't know how I was gonna deal with that. So it was the first time in my life I decided I'm gonna go to therapy. I'm gonna get some therapy so someone can help me uh, with dealing with the death of my father. So little did I know, within the first therapy session, we were talking about my marriage. And my therapist at the time was the first person that ever said to me, I was describing what it was like, and she was the first person that ever said to me, do you understand that that behavior is unacceptable? And I think I just started bawling. And I said, no one's ever said that to me before. And, and that basically started the process of me building the strength to leave. And I did, and I moved out with my girls in tow, and we found an apartment, and um, bam, round two, fish out of water. I, I left my marriage, I've been a stay-at-home mom. I had stopped teaching exercise, because all I did was take care of the kids. Uh, I showed up one day, we, we were having a bit of a dispute about alimony, and, and we had to go to court. and. Thank God, I thought we have a, a female judge. And so I um, sat there and I said, I just was hoping to get a little more alimony. I've been a stay at home mom, my girls were only six, and I'd love to have a couple more years. And she looked at me and she said, Honey, you're going to need to get a job. Yeah, ouch. So I thought, Okay, I'm going to have to figure this out. And so in the immediacy, um, I had left the marriage, we were on our own, and I still had my gym membership. And it, I belonged to a, a gym called the Reebok Club. It's now an Equinox, and it's on the Upper West Side. Beautiful, full service gym. And I understood the importance of taking care of myself. Like, I have to stay strong, and I'm gonna keep going to the gym, at least for now. And, and I did, and I used to see these spin classes going on and it looked very intimidating to me and the room was full and loud music and dark and but I was very intrigued and sure enough one day I pushed myself to get in there and try the class. I didn't go with a friend, I went by myself and that was it. I took one class and I saw what I was describing earlier, this um, catharsis that would happen where I went in there, I closed my eyes, uh, he was playing great music, and at the end of the 45 minutes, I felt like I could handle my challenges. And so I got hooked on this, and I was going to class six days a week. 
One day, and I'm sure you know how this is, you find your favorite, favorite instructor and you get, they become your guru and you're, you get very attached. And, and so I found mine and one day he stood up in front of the class and he said, by the way, everyone, I just want to let you know I'm moving to Florida. And I was like, what? Like, I didn't know, I didn't know how I was going to go on. <laughs> so I, but I, what I did know was that I had to keep spinning. And so I didn't really like the other instructors. And that was when I decided, I guess I'm, I'm just going to have to start teaching myself. I'll just become an instructor. So I auditioned and I made it in three minutes because my dance background helped a lot. And that started my career as a spin instructor at Reebok and I taught there for five years. And during those five years, I really worked at kind of honing my method and the way I like to teach. And, and I noticed a lot of things, for instance, uh, I noticed that, you know, back in the day when I started, the playlist kind of consisted of more techno music, music without lyrics, you know, music with a great beat. And I thought, I'm, I'm going to start using music that has lyrics and, and songs that people know and recognizable music because that way, you know, perhaps I can tap into a memory for some writer. I can put on a Billy Joel song and, and that's going to immediately send them back to college or, or whatever it was. And so I started doing that and, um, and was getting the feedback that people really like this. And, more and more people were coming, the lines were getting longer and longer for my class. And then the other thing I noticed, very important thing, was that we were at this beautiful gym that had an Olympic-sized pool and a basketball court and every kind of group fitness imaginable, but every, the people that came to spin only came to spin. That's all they did. And that was a huge clue for me that, hmm, if I started something that was just spin, because we didn't have that back then, um, I think they would come because they don't do any, they don't use the gym, they don't use any of the other um, options. So I had a friend who came to my class all the time and she and I used to talk about it because she loved to spin and we used to dream about having our own place, but neither one of us had the capital, we didn't have the seed money, and then one day a rider approached me and said, I love the way you teach, I love your class, I want to start a spin studio. I want it to be all about you and your method of teaching. I know nothing about spinning other than taking the class. I will fund the whole thing. What do you think? And within 30 seconds, I was like, I'm in. And I was thrilled and so excited. And from that moment, um, that was in 2005, she and I started meeting and writing our notes on napkins and figuring out exactly what we, what we wanted, wanted it to look like. But because I'm a very loyal person, um, my, f my other friend, who we used to talk about the same idea, I wanted her to be a part of it. So I asked Elizabeth if I could introduce her to Julie, you know, thinking she'd be a great asset to the partnership. She said, great. The three of us met. We all hit it off. And that was the official start of Soul Cycle. And we uh, agreed on what we wanted to look like, on the branding, on the retail and the visual ID, all of that, and um, came to our financial agreement and, and opened our doors in the spring of 2006. Uh, I've never worked harder. I was teaching 22 classes a week. Um, I didn't even hire other instructors in the beginning because I, w I was just so focused on wanting to bring my entire following over from Reebok to really um, you know, be the basis of this business. So that's why I taught so much. And, you know, in the beginning, I had four people in the class, six people in the class, but I made every class, you know, I taught every class as if it was full and, and every class was just as important, no matter how many people were in it. And slowly it started to build and the word got out. We never advertised. In fact, you'll appreciate this, after we signed the lease on this space, which was literally a hole in the wall, it was in the back of a building, it wasn't nice, we threw 33 books, bikes in the room, we barely had an office, we built a desk from Ikea, we spent nothing. And after all of this was said and done, the, they told us, oh, by the way, no signage outside. No signage. We were like, what? How can we not have signage? Like we were. We were crazed by this. It was a landmark block, and they wouldn't let us have signage. Well, 
Who would have predicted that it actually became an attribute in that it literally became the place you had to be in the know about <laughs> to find it? And literally, it got to the point where there were 20 black Escalades lined up as if it was a club. <laughs> Who knew that that would happen? Um, so business picked up, and I did eventually bring my entire following over, which was incredibly gratifying. And uh, more and more people were coming. Uh, 2006, we go to 2007, and the summer of 2007, we made the decision to open up our second studio out on Long Island in Bridgehampton, out in the Hamptons, which is a great place to have a business because the exposure is crazy. You have people summering there, as you know, I'm sure, from all over the world. And we opened our doors there in a big old barn. It was a fantastic space. In fact, they still have it. And, um, and that was it. The business exploded. And we came back to the city in the fall and literally couldn't fit everyone through our doors and had to really think quickly about expansion. In the meantime, we only had a verbal handshake agreement. And during the course of the year, before that summer, I kept asking uh, my partners, you know, we should probably sign something at this point as the business was building. And they said, yeah, no, no, we will, we will. Nothing ever got signed. And it wasn't until after that summer that they approached me and said, OK, we're ready to sign. And I said, great. And the three of us met. And all I'm going to say is uh, we met and had our meeting. And when I walked out of the meeting, I was no longer a partner in this business. Yeah. So it took me two years to be able to tell the story without crying tears of rage. It was one of the most traumatic experiences I've ever had. Um, you know, without me, the business never would have existed. Neither one of them knew anything about spinning. And in fact, I brought one of the partners in, and she stabbed me in the back. So, so that happened, and um, I didn't know what I was going to do. There was no other. There were no other boutique fitness um, businesses then. We were pretty much the only one. And I thought, okay, I guess I'm going to have to go back to the gyms and make $50 a class, and what's my choice? Um, meanwhile, I had two twin girls in high school. Um, hadn't gotten remarried, and that's okay, but I, I was on my own. And so uh, I just I had no choice. And I literally started packing up my things one day, and they looked at me and said, they, they looked at me and said, where are you going? And I said, where am I going? And they said, oh, we thought you would, you'd stay and just be an instructor. <laughs> I'm sure they did. And I looked at them like they had three heads <laughs> and said, I'm not doing that, and, and walked out. And they said, oh, and they followed me out and said, oh, but OK, well, if you get any other offers, will you just promise us you'll come back to us? Because we'll, we'll you know, counter the offer and, and just let us know. And I, I didn't even turn around. I walked out. Well, what happened was, I went back because I didn't have a choice. Because I was, again, a single mom. And they were willing to pay me more. And so I made the decision to go back to a business that was mine. But now it's no longer mine, and I'm just an instructor. So I always say that every day I walked in there, I felt like I got another gray hair. But that being said, I'd get up on the podium, and I'd hit the play button. And for those 45 minutes, it all kind of went away. And I was doing what I do, and I was connecting with my people, because they were all my people. And they were connecting with me. And I did that for two years. And in retrospect, again, if I hadn't, I would never have met my two co-founders of Flywheel. Because I met them the summer of 2009 in the barn at Bridgehampton, where I was teaching. And they approached me and said they wanted to meet. And so I did. And that was in the fall of 2009. And they set, introduced this idea of adding technology to the bike. And Ruth, what do you think? 
we, we're not creative, you know, we're, pri we're uh, private equity guys. We see, we see the dollar signs here and we want to do this. And I thought, oh, I don't know, I, you know, it's all about what goes on in your head and numbers, I, you know. Well, promise us you'll just go in the room with the bike and the computer and just try it. So I did and I realized this is going to be a game changer because for the first time, people are going to be able to measure how hard they're working, how many calories they're burning, how, how much resistance they're using, and what a great differentiator, because now I'm going to start a second business to compete with the first business that I started. <laughs> so I said I'm in, and we made a deal, and I had really good legal protection this time. <laughs> yep. And I signed across the dotted line, and we started Flywheel in <clears throat> February of 2010. And it was awesome because Having had the experience at SoulCycle, I knew exactly what worked, at least in my opinion, and what didn't work. And things like, you know, SoulCycle very quickly turned into a culture of exclusivity. As, as I kind of described, it was kind of like this club you couldn't get into, but if you got in, you felt really important and really special. And, and by the way, it worked. Um, when we started Flywheel, I wanted to go the complete opposite route. I wanted it to be all inclusive. I wanted everyone to feel special. Every shape, size, color could come through our doors and feel accepted and, and, um, and special. And so that was what we kind of set very, very early on. And I wanted our employees to feel great and our customers to feel great. And the truth is, my only real experience that I brought to both these but both these businesses came from being a mother. And so those skills that we have as mothers are really what led me to be a very successful business leader. And, and what I mean by that is, and this really happened at Flywheel, I really figured out who I was as a leader because I used qualities like empathy I listened to my employees. I, if they had a problem, I'd call them in and I'd say, let's talk about it. And everyone was heard, get it? Everyone had a voice. And everyone felt important from the um, cleaning person to the executive team. Everyone was treated equally. And the same with our customers. And it really worked. And so as a result, at Flywheel, my partners and I just built this culture that felt like family, and it was the greatest place to work. And everyone really liked each other. And talk about you know key to success. When you treat your employees that, that way, they want to succeed. They want your business to succeed just as much as you do. And so we really couldn't fail. And um, the business grew and uh, expanded. And by 2014, four years in, we had 21 studios at this point. Um, people were starting to uh, show interest in wanting to acquire the business. And we couldn't believe it. I mean, it was incredibly gratifying. And we had worked so hard for four years that you know we were kind of ready to make a little money. And um, we came very close to a deal. And um, in the meantime, two years before that, we had taken on a strategic investor. And he kind of stepped in at the 11th hour and said, look, if you're going to sell the company, I'm going to buy it. Don't sell it to those people. So that was it. We had, we had a, a sale. And um, this person acquired the business in 2014. And we were so thrilled. You know, Now it was going to be all, be all about scaling and and expanding to a much bigger level. And I had no idea, and I know this happens all the time when businesses are acquired, everything changed really quickly. And so within the first two months, my partners were out. Yeah. Which was devastating to me because as I described, I mean, we were all family and um, and so I felt very alone and very isolated. And, and the culture just quickly did a 180. It was suddenly more corporate and 
meetings after meetings and sitting in conference rooms and and the chairman wanted me to kind of spend more of my time doing that and and getting more involved on the business level and so I was kind of it was kind of like there I was back behind a desk again and really not enjoying it and um, and the last thing I wanted to do was kind of regress and and be unhappy again and and the chairman was quite a force to reckon with um, I signed a non-disparagement, so um, can't really talk about that either. However, he was narcissistic. That's all I'm going to say. Um, so there I was, back with a narcissistic person, kind of doing what I didn't want to do and kind of losing my voice. And I thought, wow, I can't do this. can't let this happen to myself. So I kind of call this last chapter Growing Pains because... I had no choice but to stand up for myself and say, you know what, this just, it's not working for me. And I really want to go back to what I've always done, which was the creative aspect of the business, what went on within the four walls of the studio, teacher training. Um, I always instructed, I've always taught through, throughout my career, but really, you know, interfacing with the instructors and connecting and connecting human beings and, um, kind of going back to that. And they said, OK. And that was a real, a real growing point for me, because it taught me that it was really about standing up for myself. But you can't stand up for yourself very well unless you have the confidence. And most importantly, unless you value yourself. Because if you don't, it's really hard to stand up. And so. By doing it, I realized, wow, I guess I do value myself, and I guess they really value me too, because they said, no problem, whatever you want. And so things got a little better, but it just wasn't the same anymore. And uh, we expanded to 42 studios, and uh, in December of 2018, I decided it was time to leave. It just the company didn't really represent me anymore, and I felt like I could no longer represent the company. So, um, so I am, in a certain sense, at a point right now where I am back figuring out what I want to do and, and kind of have to take my own advice in terms of sitting with discomfort and accepting the fact that I don't know and that the answer will come and um, having the confidence to know that I will figure it out. So, you know, when I, when I speak and when I talk, I talk a lot about resilience and reinvention because I feel that my story shows all of us that we're constantly reinventing ourselves. You know, when I tell people that I was 48 years old when I started Soul Cycle and I was 52 when I started Flywheel, people are wow. Um, but I just think it's a great example of the fact that, that we're never done. And I'm 61 again, and I am not done. Um, resilience is something I look at as a muscle. It's not a finite amount of strength that we have. It's something that we build over time when we're tested and when we fail and when we have setbacks. And what I always say is, we never truly fail unless we stop trying. And that's just not an option. We can't stop trying. And so with every setback, we build this muscle called resilience. Um, I, I have to read this. I, um, I wrote these down because I think as women especially, it's hard for us for some reason to own our strength. And, you know, throughout my career, people, various people would say to me, you're so strong. And my knee jerk reaction would be like, really? Do you think so? Like, I, I just had a hard time owning it and accepting it. And so I wrote down uh, a list of why I'm strong. And sometimes I have to go back to it to remind myself, but I'm, I, I like to read it because I think in some way it can resonate, hopefully, with all of you, maybe one or two of them. So here goes. I am strong because the years I spent training as a professional dancer gave me practice in persistence and discipline. 
I am strong because of the way I handled my father's death and sought out support instead of going it alone. I am strong because leaving my marriage took moral courage. I am strong because of all the years I spent trying to find the right career, struggling as a single working mom the entire time. I am strong because I started not one, but two massively successful indoor cycling companies. I am strong because when I had to leave one of those companies, I got back on the bike and tried again. I am strong because I put myself out there to share my story, complete with all my mess ups and low points, because I wanna be there for you to encourage your own resilience should you need it just now. So, thank you. Thanks. So just to finish, so this is the point, and this is bringing us all back to the spin class. This is the point where I say, okay, get on your bikes, turn up the resistance, and let's go, because we never coast. Thank you.